welcome back to episode seven of Inside X. It's been seven weeks already into this. Got my XD Thermo right there, Rockstar, keeping me going through these weeks. And uh, if everything had went as planned, this would have been the closing of Arena Cross. We would have had an Arena Cross champion from this past weekend. But as things go, we're going to start the season in July. On this show today, we have the insider trading. We actually talk about motocross schools, camps and schools across the country. We're going to take a look at those. I know Galdi has a lot of influence on young guys coming up in Ontario. We're going to look at those schools across Canada. The Rockstar recap for this week, we go to Quebec, Deschambeau, a big day for Jess Pettis there. We actually have Jess Pettis on later on the show. Parts Canada prediction, we have three 450 riders we're going to look at, actually three American 450 riders. We're going to take a look at those guys in a bit. Um, guest interviews, like I said, Jess Pettis, he's going to be on. We're going to talk about uh, his knee injury, his injury going into last season and his championships. Uh, Rockstar OTSF team manager Steve Sims, we're going to check in with him, see how his team's making out during this off time and getting ready back into the racing scene. We're going to jump to quick commercial, but I'd just like to thank Data Video for hooking up the whole system here in studio. Uh, Parts Canada, Rockstar Energy, obviously get these at 7-Eleven near you. Uh, we got Royal Distributing. Cardo Systems and Yamaha Motor Canada all hooking it up here, bringing this show to you each week. We're going to jump to a quick, quick commercial and we'll be right back. And we're back with another installment of Insider Trading. I'm joined now by Ryan Gold, my co-host here. Ryan, good to see you, buddy. Hey, buddy. Good to see you as well, Kyle. Always great to touch base and uh, lots of action in the last uh, week or so across the country as far as tracks and whatnot. And uh, it's get, it's kind of exciting right now. I'm a little excited. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, exciting, especially in Ontario, opening up and a lot of other tracks across Canada open up. And one thing I want to talk about, and I know there's a lot of uh, new bike owners, uh, new bike riders, people getting into the sport during this time because team sports are kind of out of the, the uh, reach for a lot of these people. The hockeys, the soccers, all those things are down. So one thing I wanted to talk about was uh, motocross schools. And I know you have a great background on this. You've uh, worked at Motopark. Uh, you've done it for years since you were a, a first became a pro rider. I just want to get the importance. Why is it important and what's the level of these camps, um, how they can get into it? Well, I mean, the, obviously the important factor, that's pretty simple. Just like anything, you go to school to learn about the basics of life, whether it be math or English or whatever it may be, to get yourself better as the way you go along or what you want to become a professional in the working world. Same as motocross, if you want to start small and then you, uh, you, know, you start getting the feel for the bars and the bike and the comfort of it all, and you want to get better, you go to somebody who is a teacher or an elite pro athlete or a place like a moto park that has an academy where you learn these things. Um, and like I said, the importance of it, that's just to help hone those skills um, from you, when you start to learn how to ride. As everybody gets on a small bike, they get comfortable, start maybe doing a little bit of jumping, get a little bit faster, start switching gears, get onto the clutch. There's always somebody outside of mom or dad that's going to give you a little bit more advancement uh, towards reaching that ultimate goal if you want to become a racer, which is obviously being at the pro level and chasing our Cole Thompson's, Phil Nicoletti, or becoming a six-time like Colton Fasciati. Um, and there are tons of places right across our nation, which is pretty cool, the fact that now Ontario itself actually has a solidified system of a social um, where everybody has a website or a social, social uh, uh, feed where you can follow them, whether it be MX Schools, Moto Park Racing, MX 101 at Santa Lee, um, uh, the, uh, the camp up at the, with the Zeka boys. Now I just drawn a blank on the name of that one. Uh, camp, camp of the Deaf, sorry, Camp of the Deaf up there where Honda creates it. And then other provinces have other little things, uh, where like Honda across the nation has a thing called the Red Rider Academy, where you can go onto the Honda website and register your name and get into a part, whether, whatever province you're in and go to certain places. So for us, Moncton is a huge uh, part of our national series of track. They host Honda Red Rider groups all the time where you can be as young as four years old or uh, up to 50 years old, be a girl, be a boy, whatever it is, and get yourself sort of fixated on a bike and kind of learn how to do it. 
out in BC or Alberta, there's a lot of like local pros. The Future West Moto scene out there, which is our regional racing series, has a group between Ryan Lockhart and Kyle Beaton where you can really get on with those guys and get like hand on uh, hand hand training or face to face training with an actual professional racer. Or over at Cam Loops, Brock Littner, Brock Hoyer, who is an X Games gold medalist, a uh, gold medalist, sorry, uh, they do schools on the Whispering Prize property at, at Cam's Loops. So the best way to go about it is uh, obviously you can visit mrcracing.com. We have this kind of information, or just hit up a local pro racer, or go to that local dealership and ask. Uh, questions of how you can kind of get pointed into the areas there is because every province has something and uh, it might not be out as uh, easy to find like in some of the Ontario ones but it's out there and there's a way to get yourself taught properly and just kind of get an advantage if racing is something that you want to become good at yeah that's exactly it and we're in a sport where it's not uh like we talked about hockey and stuff like that where you sign up for hockey you have a coach on that team so he takes care of you does the drills where motocross you're an individual you got to you go outside the box a little bit. Like you said, you got a, a bike from a dealership. You ask that dealership, hey, where's the closest place to ride? Do they have a school? You know, if you got a track close to you, uh, there's lots of uh, people in Calgary. They have Wild Rose right in the, the city. So there's lots of places to uh, to talk to and, and get that info. And usually if you know a pro rider, they have, you know, lots of time on their hands. They can uh, help you out and uh, get you that level you need. And the biggest thing we want to uh, stress is a safety part of it. You get these bikes, they go fast, and we just want everybody to ride safe and just be comfortable on the bike and then just progress from there. And as you get better, you can get to these races uh, MRC puts on and, and go from there. But uh, Exactly. Yeah, and one more thing. Don't, don't ever be afraid to ask. Sometimes people are always afraid to ask for help. Just hit it up. Like I said, hit up your local dealer. Search motocross online, motocross Canada. Something will pop up that will lead to you. And from my experience, especially in the last week or so, somebody will get back to you with good news or a direction of where you can go. So don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, and before we go to commercial, I wanted to correct you on the one thing, the Def Camp. It's Moto Camp by those Zeka boys. Ah, there, there you go. And Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's run by Honda. But anyways, that's uh, great info again, Galdi. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll have some slides thrown over here and uh, more info. Obviously, MRC racing.com for all that kind of info reach out to those emails on that site and they'll help you out but uh, we're going to jump to a quick commercial we'll be back with more inside x All right, Kyle, it is that time for the Rockstar Energy Recap 250 Pro Moto number two. In Moto one, we saw Jess Pettis claim his second Moto victory of the year early in that day there. He was looking amazing. And once again here, Pennington, who got third in Moto number one, pulls the whole shot in Moto number two. That kid was on fire and kind of out of nowhere. Yeah, we're finally seeing Pennington, the, the hire they had for Club MX, finally showing his true colors there and getting out front early in both motos there. He's hawking that huge double there. <laughs> but, uh, man, right now you don't see is the number one. Obviously won that first moto. He's buried in the pack. He's going to have a lot of work cut out for him to get this overall. A rough first moto for the MX-101 ride of the num uh, number 94, Rensland. He's going to be strong in this one. We keep tabs on him. But right there, the 14 and 10 award, man, I feel like every few weeks or the last few weeks we've been watching these, Kyle, 14 keeps hitting the ground when he's in great position. Yeah, and heads up. There goes the dozer around into first. And, man, he was on a mission this moto and just trying to make up some points on that Triple Crown series. Obviously, Dylan Wright running away with that one. And there he is. The guy, number 19 out here, runs this track well. He's always up there in contention for an overall. He needs to get around Dozer for this win. Yeah, look at that. Welton sliding in there as well. This is a great battle all day long. It was kind of wild because the whole day was kind of mired with a little bit of sprinkle, then some heavy rain, then no rain. And obviously with the sand, when it gets wet, it's crazy for traction. But look at how close these guys were able to battle. And everybody making passes. Here comes Madags trying to make a move on Pennington. Unfortunately, Pennington didn't quite have the same kind of mustard under his throttle in this second moto he kind of faded back getting that third moto one was awesome to see but just great battles all the way along and then Tanner Ward trying to make that pass again on him here they actually connect oh. this is great slamming into each other 
Wardy, he never gives up, but man, he just makes those kind of small mistakes that have kept taking him away from him. And uh, it was awesome, though. Like like I said, Cal, every moto, and then there it is, boom, the number one out of nowhere. Yeah, and then Pettis goes on a mission here, passing those two guys real quick. And uh, he's got to go. He's got to get up to third right now as it sits. And Dylan Wright is making that push for this overall. He's all over Luke Renslin. And w unreal battles in this class, actually in both classes all day. With this rain and the way that the, the dirt worked up, it was unreal battles. Yeah, traction was uh, amazing. No matter where you went, you could go in any line, cross any uh, jump, do whatever you wanted. So it really gave the riders an opportunity to just kind of let it hang out. And it really showed. And uh, I was watching this one right here. Oh, just a little bit short for Pettis right there. He was going for it. It was awesome to see. This pass right here on Welton would give him that overall. But it was the MX101 Rotostributing.com FXR Yamaha rider, Luke Renslin, bringing home a second moto win of the year. All right, sorry, I guess it was third because I forgot about the Manitoba round where we kind of gave him one after the docking. But he earned this one. Dylan Wright caught him, and then he pulled it back out, Kyle. It was impressive. Yeah, great riding there with uh, Pettis. Wright going 2-2, Renslin with that 8-1, and uh, Marshall Welton 6-4, and a 4-6 for Tanner Ward, rounding out that top five. Great battles all day in that class. We're going to jump into the 250 here, Goldie, where the battles just heat up even more, and it's a, a, a tipping point for a couple uh, riders in this series, not just the MX Tour, but the Triple Crown. We're going to jump to that right now. Yes, Kyle, but unfortunately you are incorrect. It is the 450 Rockstar Energy Recap right here, my friend. You crazy guy. You get it wrong. But once again, the number 800 doing his thing, Kyle. Every time the gate drops, how can you not bet on that guy? I don't know. I'd be making a lot of money if I was betting somebody, but I'm sure the odds weren't that great. But look at this. All the big boys out front early in this first moto. And that guy, you should be scared of the number two. He is unreal fast in the sand. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Nicoletti, a little endo. Cole Thompson, endo. And then Fasciati, all endoing that. Uh, all, step up. <laughs> all three of them. Earlier that week, we had a couple of amateurs, actually, that got hurt. Remember, this is the week of the ECAN leading into the Pro National here. And a couple of amateurs actually did that thing on that jump. There's, like, this little kicker. And apparently, it came back out on the Saturday here, the Pro National, the Rockstar Energy Triple Crown as well. But, man, like we alluded in the 250, endless battles all day long. Every time we put the camera on something, they were within about six to eight bike lengths. And Phil Nicoletti, man, once again, just the warrior out there, charging, pushing, could never make it happen in this first moto. But, man, he would never let Alessi get too far away. What I like about Phil is he doesn't care where his feet are, where his elbows are. He yeah. is just pinned all the time, letting that bike do whatever it wants, and he's just wide open. It's awesome to see, especially on a track this gnarly. We were talking about getting some lessons, stuff like that. I don't know if you'd want to learn from Phil as a young kid. Okay, so, Dad, my legs can go this way, my arm can go that way, my butt can get off the seat, and I'm still going to win a pro national? Well, son, I don't know. Phil's a little different. But anyway, Phil makes it work when Phil needs to. 800 still up there. And it's funny watching Alessi. Every time I watch these recaps week to week, Alessi, it doesn't really look like he's ever charging. It's kind of wild watching him. But an interesting fact of this moto, last or two weeks ago we saw Santa Lee. Everybody kind of throws it away or Nicoletti and Alessi have their thing and kind of give Fasciotti the nod to pull ahead. But in this moto here, Fasciotti kind of showed that he was human. He got passed by a lot of guys, and this was actually his worst moto finish of the 2019 season. In incredible. And maybe uh, to do with a little bit of slick conditions, and he wasn't trying to ride over the top knowing that he had the points lead. But right here, he loses a lot of points with Alessi being out front, him dropping back. We'll see Cole Thompson go by him here shortly. And uh, that's a lot of points lost in the championship. And, and man, like you got to think, you got to pin it a little bit more than that if you want to take home that six championship. Yeah, I bet you after this moto, there was a bit of a head shake, or maybe it's just a simple uh, thing of, you know, the bike setup wasn't in. I can't remember the actual interview that I would have done with him after this, but Michael Essie holding up the one. He's still great there. He was going on a good streak, but look at them finishing. Phil just crossed the line. Gurky just crossed the line. Thompson right there and Fasciotti right there. The top six riders were within about eight to ten seconds right there. It was amazing for us to call the moto and all the fans on hand right there, even with the drizzle. It never stopped with action into moto number two here. And uh, again, that picture basically shows it. And I'm watching here. Look at Alessi. He's way down before everybody else is. I don't know if that's just the way he does it kind of thing, but he's always ready. Boom. Gets the uh, the triple crown with the rolldistributing.com all shot. Doubles up on the day. But this time, Nicoletti Fasciotti right there in tow. And man, we were going to have a banger of a moto here. 
Nothing cooler than that start there, Galdi. And to loot on the, the thing you were talking about earlier, we were watching lap times all day, and the guy in six could have been the fastest one lap, but then the guy in the lead yeah, was the fastest right. the next lap, and then second. It was crazy tight, and here we go again. Top five guys. Actually, we're missing Gurky here. I think he went down early in this moto. He had to come from behind, but the top four guys all in that title contention, and Nicoletti out here trying to track down Alessi. Yeah, and you're going to watch the kill. He actually looks like he's just nice and calm uh, as he's chasing them down here. And I believe Alessi is, remember we had those he had those hands, those blisters just kept getting worse and worse. And the East Coast part of our series, there's not much break to it. And the tracks just get gnarlier and gnarlier as we make our way into the final round of the Transcan there. And Phil, I think, has started taking advantage of that. You can see that they were closing in very easy. And then here's that big shot of your brother, man. He was woozy right there, Kyle. And this is what I was talking about earlier. This is the turning point for his triple crown. He gave up too many points. This moto, obviously, Dean DNF this one with the bars and looked like a bit of a head injury there. And uh, Nicoletti going on to chase down Alessi. That was a big 30-point swing in the triple crown championship. And uh, another point switch here is we'll see as Alessi deals with that hand. And there's Cole trying to get off the track safely. Yeah. Very sketchy with those bars. Yeah, that was a big get off, man. Look at the bend on those bars. And here it is. There are one, two, and three. So tight right here. And right around now, and as we were in the booth, we could kind of feel like Alessi just wasn't wasn't hanging on, wasn't comfortable on that bike there. You can kind of see him being a little humble. Look at the lines he's taking here. They just don't really make sense. He's kind of chopping. He's fighting the bike. And right now, boom, you see him look over. He's like, uh-oh, these guys have got me right here. And Phil just throws a dirty pass. Yeah, Phil right up the inside. And it looked like Alessi was going to come back at him. But like you said, those hands, and he showed us after every race, those hands were just uh, meat grindered. And uh, he couldn't recover from that. Another great battle, a little further yeah. back. Ryan Dowd, Chase Marquier, and uh, Cade Clayson, all American riders, battling for that top five. Well, if you remember, too, and I love that. Look at that little double in of the corner Clayson was doing. That, that was awesome. There was, like, there was that top five, or sorry, top four battle. Then we lose Cole. Then it was the top three with Meston sitting by himself in behind him. But we don't even show him in the highlight package here. And then this battle going on. And then, boom, at the very last lap, another battle here. Fastiotti would just not give up. He found something that he forgot in moto number one. He found it in moto number two. And these guys went wire to wire right down. And here comes that checker flag. And I kind of giggle right now. Watch Phil here. Just OJ's that finish line. <laughs> Lands flat, but he's pumped. And then, boom, here's the respect level between these two. High fives, courtesy, they love it. And then if you remember too, after this moto, the meat grinding hands of Michael Lessie and the regular hands of Phil Nicoletti shook after this moto here, saying job. good job from Stanley. There it is, Nicoletti, Alessi, Fasciati, Gurky, and Dowdy, 6-5 on the day. And if you remember, Kyle, he gets fifth, and his dad got like 14th, I think, on the day. Yeah, that's uh, something we didn't mention. Uh, we'll actually talk about Ryan Dowd here shortly in our pred Parts Canada prediction. But uh, John Dowd, always showing up today, Sean, but loves that track qualifies well and finishes like top 15 is just remarkable for his age. I think he's like 56 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 55 or 56. Good job. Good job, Dowdy. Yeah, <laughs> unreal. Anyways, we're going to jump to a quick commercial. We'll be back with more Inside X. From day one, Fox has created products with intention and purpose. So we can inspire your best ride, your fastest race, your greatest adventure. It's how we connect and how we dream. We were made for inspiration and for possibilities, for fast starts and long journeys, for challengers and for champions. Fox was made for you. So get out there and do what you're made for. Back with another Parts Canada prediction. Goldie, i got another three riders in that 450 class. we just seen one of them in, actually two of them in that uh, recap. Chase Marquier is the first guy I want to bring up. He's riding the Honda this year. He rode Supercross with that Manluck team, and he's going to carry that into the 450 class for our outdoor and probably indoor portion of the Triple Crown. What are your thoughts on Chase Marquier this year? Uh, well, from what I got to see last year, he's uh, a good rider. Smart on the bike, consistent. Um, maybe lacking a little bit of speed, obviously, because he was right around the 8, 9, 10 mark there for the majority of the motos that we did get to see him. Uh, funny story about him here. About two years ago when I was playing a fantasy league, which I'm, I hate doing it because I get so darn mad, I'm like, he, he qualified, I think, the week before in one of the Supercross races in the 250 class, and I picked him. I didn't pick him that week because you're not allowed to pick him, so I pick him the next week. He didn't make it. I screamed at my television about at this guy that had no idea who he was, Privateer on the dude, Marquis. I thought he was like a French guy with his name like that or something. I was just 
belligerently yelling at the TV at Chase Marquet. I didn't get a chance to uh, really cross paths too much with him uh, at, at later in the year when we got to see him race up here, but seems like a real good guy. He's got some skill, and uh, coming back this year under that man luck team, I can only figure he'll be a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable, and obviously with a little bit more confidence as well. A little bit of downtime before we get back to the track, which is probably making him get better training, get more comfortable on the bike. So uh, I can see good things out of Chase this year, a little bit more better on that bike, maybe a little closer to like Keelan Meston with that fifth, the six, seven range. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that uh, if anybody could step it up, I think Chase on that team could step it up another level. Obviously you said uh, eight, 10 range there last year. I know he trains at Robbie Renard's place down Renard's uh, raceway there. And it's guys like Forkner, Bogle, uh, Colton Nichols. Those guys are going to help him elevate that game. And, I mean, you're dealing with the hot heat of Oklahoma. Yeah. I think once we hit that, those summer months, you get uh, a Gopher Dunes heat like we normally see or a Santa Lee. He's going to be excelling in that, in that heat. So look for him to uh, really have a, a, you know, a big year this year. To be honest with you, I think he'll be pushing the top five, five range each moto. And I just think the knowledge he took from last year's racing, I think it's going to help him this year. The next guy I want to talk to, and we've just seen him in the uh, recap as well, Ryan Dowd on a privateer Suzuki, looking to get on a team for this year. We just didn't have the, uh, the luck finding the, a team that would take him, but always good, and especially on the East Coast where we're starting at Gopher Dunes. What are your thoughts, with Ryan Dowd? Well, obviously the name itself just ensues toughness and, and uh, all heart. And uh, John Dowd, his father, who is an icon in our sport there, and is basically giving anybody over 50 years old a reason to keep riding dirt bikes. Uh, has a son Ryan and man he's a great guy fun to be around an absolute bulldog on that bike and we saw that, that was his best result there at Deschambeau I think the only thing that bites Ryan uh, in the butt and I can only say this from sometimes when I see his social feed to be honest with you he's very outspoken sometimes I think maybe you need to zip it and just do the work he's very outspoken I feel like sometimes that bites him in the butt because he feels like maybe he needs to out he speaks too much to his to over a top of what his character is he just needs to do that down family toughness, all heart kind of racer. And I believe that's what he is because it shows when the gate drops there. And uh, sometimes maybe just leave the, you know, the, the voice, the opinion to yourselves. He's very political too sometimes, which is kind of wild. I read those things on his social feeds. But you know what? Leave that stuff to the side. Stick to that motocross thing. He's good on that dirt bike. And I know, like you said, if we start this thing and we go in the East, the tough will survive and go for doing St. Lee in that heat. And he's going to be one of those guys. Yeah, I agree. And I always like talking to you, Ryan. He, uh, Traveled out west with his mechanic. It was his first time out west last year and traveled all the way out there from, I believe he's from Massachusetts. So that's, yep. a, that's across the country and uh, made it work to do those three rounds last year. Really enjoyed it and loves the series. He earned himself a clear yeah. number 14, which is huge. And it's something to go back on when his dad was a factory Yamaha rider. He run the number 14. So yeah, very cool. a little bit uh, a salute yeah. to his dad's yeah. career. And obviously... You know, he's in that shadow uh, of John Dowd, his dad, for so long that he's finally breaking out of that and he's becoming his own rider. So very cool to see that. The last rider, another American rider, Josh Cartwright. He's riding for that Kawasaki PRMX team. And uh, we've seen him late in the series last year. He got that uh, Sandley hole shot and had some good results uh, there, uh, as well as uh, Riverglade. What are your thoughts on Josh Cartwright coming back in that 450 class? He is an absolute beauty. I don't know how many times you got a chance to talk to kid. Super respectful, very humble, and just uh, loves Canada. Loves everything we do. Loves us as announcers. Loves every track. Loves the shape of the gates. Loves the flag. Loves the food. Like He is so happy to be racing up here, and I'm so glad. Hopefully he comes back again this summer, man. And again, yeah, the results kind of got better as the series got going on. I mean, he, he uh, got some great starts on that PRMX cow, like you were saying, with the Bondi engine in there, giving him that a little extra juice. But, man, just a great kid. I've actually known Josh from when I used to announce back in the AMA Arena Cross days. His mother used to work for the series and also be a part of one of the teams. And he was just a little guy doing, like, the 65 class where they were like, do you want a kiss or the trophy from the uh, Arena Cross girl? So uh, just, a, just an absolute great kid. I love what I see. And like the other two guys we were talking about, once they kind of get going, the, the confidence rises, they, they just keep clicking away. So I feel like Cartwright could be one of those guys. He is going to be a part of the return of Supercross on May 31st. So he'll have some races under his belt compared to some of the other guys. By the time Gopher Dunes hit, I think he's going to be ready. And uh, if we see him there, man, I, I could definitely see him turn some heads and doing enough uh, in his corner to maybe get something working for him in 2021. Yeah, I agree. And he's with a great crew there. Um, Julian Pierre Max really takes care of those guys. And I do know uh, Josh through racing down in the arena cross in the States for years ago, like early 2010, 11 ish. 
when he was just coming out of amateur. And man, you're right, he's an absolute beauty. Uh, if any fan sees him at a track, go up and talk to him. He yeah. will spend the time to talk to you. Um, just one of those guys, great to, to be around. And an unreal talent, very good indoors. His outdoor skills are getting better. So I actually think that he's, he could fit himself right in that top five. And I think it's gonna be a great battle right in that, that we'll call that the Keelan Meston region, uh, yeah. <laughs> four, five, six, seven. And uh, it's gonna be interesting to see all those guys there. Anyways, Goldie, that's another three riders reviewed. And uh, good job by you. I always like the info and the, uh, the background stories you have with them. We're gonna jump to commercial and we'll come back. Before the lights, before the cameras, before the crowd roar, before the gate drops, before the first turn, before the finish line, the podium, and the champagne. It's just me and my gear. I'm being joined now by the KTM 250 rider, uh, Jess Pettis. Jess, man, good to see you. Uh, I see that you were just traveling recently. Uh, how's it uh, feel to be back home? It's great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely nice to be home. <clears throat> um, was yeah, gone back in Florida for a couple months, and uh, yeah, had a had a great time down there, getting back on the bike and and all that good stuff. But uh, obviously, some crazy times. So it's nice to be back home, and uh, yeah, in the homeland. Yeah, no kidding. And I see like uh, you're always great about uh, putting uh, videos and posts up on your social media. And I seen that you're boxing up your uh, your KTM and sending it back to Prince George. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, about two weeks ago, or uh, a week and a half ago, I guess, I was at GPF and uh, had to create the bike up, and I sent that back to KTM, actually, in Montreal, and okay. and then they sent me a bike a couple weeks ago back out to Prince George, so okay. I could have a bike back here a little, when little I uh, bike swap. back on the bike. Yeah, yeah, nice bike, bike swap and uh, freshy for you to start back riding once this quarantine. I know you're in a 14-day quarantine. How was, I just want to ask you before we get into uh, the racing, how was the uh, the traveling, the way things are right now with uh, coronavirus and stuff like that? How was the airport and, and that stuff? Yeah, obviously it was a bit weird and, and eerie for sure. I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I was just grateful I could actually get a flight and get back into Canada because who knew, uh, you know, what was going on if I'd even be able to, to travel. So. The airports were, were a w bit weird for sure. Uh, there's like nobody. It was like a ghost town. And the plane, there's probably 15, 20 people. Everyone's spaced out, like taking it serious. So it was yeah. definitely weird. You know, airports are usually super busy and complete opposite. So uh, it yeah. was weird, but at least everyone's, you know, taking it serious. And uh, yeah, face masks, wash my hands. That's all you can do. And yeah. Yeah. Man, that's uh, that's cool. It's good to hear because I'm like literally you're the first person I talked to that uh, has flown since this all went down. So it's good. It's probably a good thing that you're just like, hey, there's nobody here. I can kind of just have my own space and, and feel a little bit uh, safer with that. Anyways, I wanted to jump back and, and start, you know, just talk about your, your amateur career. Obviously, growing up in Prince George, man, I, that's not the prime location for motocross. How did you get started and how did, like what tracks were you going to and what age did you get started at? Yeah, it's definitely not the, the easiest little town to come from. Uh, you know, it's pretty far north, so not a lot of dirt bikers from here, and we can ride pretty well, I guess, about six months of the year, and then the rest is cold and snow. So it ain't great, but we made the best of what we had, the situation we know we were dealt with, and uh, thankfully I had a good supportive family the whole time, you know, always willing to travel and get to sunny weather, head down south for, you know, even a couple weeks in the, you know, spring break or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we were fully committed. My family put in a lot. And my return to that was, uh, you know, work my work my butt off and don't let them down because they're, you know, investing quite a bit into it. And it's just a whole family effort. Um, we don't have exactly the the most, you know, the greatest tracks or like, you know, no California by no means. But we may do with sand pits or local tracks here and there or traveling. And, um, and yeah, I'm grateful for it to, to get me to the point where I'm at. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's a, it all comes down to travel and uh, all, all families in the sport have to travel a lot. You just had that extra bit North to come down to like even the Southern BC where it's a little bit more competitive. The guys are going a little quicker and then a little bit further to go to California for uh, winter training. But I know like just seeing, I know your sisters and, and your family are so supportive and then they're just such a huge Jess Pettis fan. So they went to, you know, everything they, they put everything in there and worked together and you made it happen to come from the small town of Prince George, so North to being a champion in, uh, in the country you grew up in. So that was 
very cool. Now, going back to the amateur a little bit, uh, going to Walton, and I actually talked to Dylan Wright last week. Obviously, you had battles with him and another rider who actually just announced his retirement from pro racing, Weston Rosina. It had to be pretty crazy coming all the way from Prince George to Walton, a small town of Walton, and battling with these guys growing up and making it to the pro ranks. Yeah, definitely crazy for sure. Um, you know, being out west, we had had some good good local series and, and arena crosses and whatnot that always kept us busy. But uh, you know, obviously, as everyone knows, the main motocross hub is in Ontario. Uh, all the big amateur races and uh, most of the industry is there. All the teams, um, and it kind of came down to that. If I really want to make it go and and make this sport serious and not just just for fun, but to hopefully try and make something out of it one day that. You know, we had to head east and, and race against the fastest guys. Um, you know, it's always good to win. It feels good to win, you know, even local series. But at the end of the day, you got to try and do what's best for your career. And that was head out east, uh, you know, race Walton, race those big amateur races and uh, try and get on the radar of the teams and just the industry. And that's what we did. It, it never was easy. Those guys are, are always on it. There's a lot of fast amateurs and um, didn't really know what to ever expect. But I'm so glad we did that, took the you know, load up the motorhome, the family and, and headed out there. It's about a 40, 50 hour drive. And, um, oh, I think it's a, it's a great experiment. A lot of families got to experience it. Um, and it, it's one of those things, you know, you invest into a rider or into the, the program to try and benefit and it's only going to help you. Yeah, man. And that's a, in perspective, 50 hours, that's a, that's a, a week's trip of like driving, especially if it's just your dad driving the motorhome or your mom. Um, but no, I have uh, great memories of you and Weston actually uh, battling it in Super Minis. You were such a little guy back then. And then uh, even a little guy when you went into the pro ranks, you were just an intermediate rider, I think, when you first got your feet wet on the Kawasaki. And I believe you had kind of a, like a B support ride from Leading Edge. Was that, was that your, your first chance of racing the pro? And how did that go for you? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, obviously, it's a big learning curve. Um, you know, I was, I was definitely young. I think I went pro at... I think I was about 16 or 17. Um, you know, that's okay for some riders, I guess, but I was definitely a pretty small kid and hadn't hit that growth spurt quite yet. So it uh, it was a rough couple couple first years of pro, uh, to say the least, a lot of injuries and, and stuff that kind of held me back. But at the end of the day, just kept our head down. And, yeah, I, I first went pro on the, the leading edge Kawasaki team, and they helped support me, um, you know, for some of the races out there. And uh, it came to the point where I had to, I think what was best for my career is, to do to do it on our own and we took that step back to try and refresh and and did some did it as a family support um so we did it uh you know pretty well my first full year pro completely privateer effort with our family went across and got some okay results it was nothing spectacular by no means but um you know put our head down top 10 guy and uh, just worked from there um always kind of tried to set new realistic goals and and try and reach those and thankfully you know, from there, it led on to uh, the MX 101 guys that, that picked me up. And uh, that was a big step for me, for sure. But the first yeah. couple of years, it wasn't easy by no means. No. And it's uh, in my mind, I feel like you've always been like it's only been a couple of years since you've been the top guy and, and the, the guy to beat. But it just feels like it's been forever. I, I know that the uh, obviously the Triple Crown came in and, and that season so long now that uh, it feels like you've been in that number one, you know, the guy to beat uh, for a long time. But man, when you first came in, I can remember, uh, you know, a lot of critics, a lot of doubt there. And all of a sudden, you know, you just kept chipping away. And I think that goes back to having a strong family structure behind you and believing in your, your program. And like, like the cliche saying is, uh, you know, trust the process. And man, it, it took you a bit, but the glimmer of hope when that MX 101 picks you up and you started getting those wins and then the, eventually the championship, how much of a grime was that behind the scenes? Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand uh, with the sport in general. I mean, every every rider, every family, I'm sure they they all go through their ups and downs. It's, uh, you know, it looks like a cool life from the outside for sure. And, you know, we get to race dirt bikes for a living. And don't get me wrong, it's it's amazing. I would never change the world for it. But uh, it's a lot of stuff behind the scenes, uh, injuries, and, and, you know, a lot of downs for sure. And I think you just got to overcome a lot of those. And family support's huge, obviously. Everyone knows that. And just keep grinding because uh, you put your head down and work hard. Uh, you know, eventually it's gonna gonna pay off. It's just a matter of time. Sometimes you can get stuck in a bit of a rut, and it, uh, it doesn't seem like it's all worth it. But uh, thankfully, I kept grinding, and yeah, the one on one guys they picked me up, and that was honestly a big a big thing for me. Uh, I I didn't really have a whole lot to my name other than some top tens, maybe a top five here and there. But um, I mean, obviously the guys want to pick you up and 
and go win or win right away. But it's not always that easy. It's a bit of a, a building building block for sure. Yeah, and uh, obviously last year coming into the new role with KTM, Red Bull KTM, you had an injury, and then you again had another grinded out season, and then it a glimmer of hope where you started the Supercross with that that main event win, and then the second main event uh, you slid out just as an innocent crash and uh, blew your knee out. One thing I mentioned to Galdi in the past episodes is this time this Corona thing is just kind of give you a chance to fully recover, get the body back in shape for the season. You must be kind of thankful that this happened you know and obviously we want to go racing but at least you're going to be 100 percent when we start for sure yeah um yeah as everyone knows last year was was tough for me coming into the outdoors injured um not even close to 100 percent my body and uh definitely grinded it out just trying to put my head down and, and tried our best and, and we got better as the year went on and then yeah obviously the unfortunate band at montreal just a, a little slip up with a with a high consequence uh it was Bit of a bummer biggest injury i've had to ever overcome for sure it's uh mentally it was really tough it's you know about seven months off the bike and being stuck and you know i'm usually down, down south in some nice weather you know training away and, and riding and it's not too, not so bad but being in the snow all winter it's uh it was tough it was a change and had to just adapt and, and make the best of it i kept my head down honestly the whole time every every day of the week pretty well um with rehab program kind of doing whatever i could to help my knee um, no, I wasn't riding dirt bikes, so I basically was trying to do anything to get back as soon as I could and, you know, as quickly, but as safe as possible. And, um, I gave myself the, the time frame of the first round in, uh, when the original series was supposed to start and that's what I worked towards and I would have been ready for it, but this time's definitely, definitely going to help me out. And, uh, you know, it's what we're dealt with. No one expected this, but it's uh, deal with it. And I'm glad that we're going to be going racing for sure. Well, that's, uh, I appreciate you coming on here, and I'm really looking forward. To, uh, as much as I love seeing that number one on the KTM, I'm actually looking forward to seeing your career number 15 on that KTM this year. I've already seen some pics and some video of you riding with it, so very cool to have that career n uh, number, and uh, I think definitely uh, something that you're out there for vengeance. You're going to try to get that number one plate back uh, moving forward, but thanks again, Jess, and uh, you stay safe. Uh, enjoy the rest of the time in quarantine and getting back on that uh, fresh KTM you got. Yeah, thanks, guys. I uh, definitely appreciate it. And we'll be seeing you guys soon. Uh, racing, I'm pumped. We'll uh, look forward to it. All right, buddy. Talk soon. Welcome back, and now I am joined by Rockstar Energy OTS FF Manager, uh, Steve Sims. Steve, it's great to see you. How you been? Uh, I've been pretty good. Uh, trying to keep busy with things and uh, keeping up on where we are racing-wise and when we might be able to go back racing. Yeah, I know there's uh, lots of talks, and I know during quarantine, I think your shop's right at your, your home base, so it's easy for you to stay busy with work. Yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of my life in there, whether it's my own shop stuff or race team side of things. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, across my driveway and I'm into the shop. So uh, we keep busy in there and uh, just kind of trying to see where things are going. Yeah, now the race bike's ready to go. You guys did your testing yet or is that still to come? All the testing's been done. Um, we put everything pretty much on hold um for Reese and cam about a month and a half ago yeah. um so the race bikes aren't built but uh we're waiting for a few pieces still to come in with the backup into the u.s and i'm um, just kind of waiting for things to start out and then decide when we're going to all get back to work full time and uh build things all back up again yeah and you still got i seen a, a post recently you still have uh is rizzy and uh, cam are both your your wrenches there for uh, uh matt or sorry matt not matt uh phil and uh, sean yeah, they're coming back again. So uh, they've been working with us up until a month and a half ago. There, yeah. We kind of had to let them lay them off, I guess you would say, for a little bit. And yeah. then uh, 
they're ready to come back whenever we go. Yeah, I think everybody's itching to get back to doing what they do best. But uh, let's just uh, rewind a little bit and get to a, a base of where you started from. I know I met you years ago uh, racing in Ontario, provincials and stuff like that, uh, growing up, you know, both Ontario kids. But what, what made the conversion over to uh, being a mechanic first? I know you started with Andre years ago. Give us a little rundown of how that happened. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I started racing when I was in grade eight, so 12, 13 years old, and I uh, quickly got into the intermediate class, but kind of realized that uh, I wasn't going to be making a lot of money going racing. Um, I was a decent intermediate at the time, but I figured I found out quickly that the next level was quite a bit higher than I was probably ready to go. So um, at that point, I went into high school and I started looking for apprenticeships and stuff. Uh, to start working and that's where I found Bill Burr and with Bill Burr I just kind of linked up um, with him and Joel Serrett he was helping heavily back then so I got linked up with Joel back in I think it was about 2002 2003 and we did nationals and it kind of just went from there with uh, Jay Burke and Rob McCullough and then uh, into 05 I think it was winter 05, Colton and I did U.S. Supercrosses um, in the U.S. We stayed at Dean Wilson's place for the winter. Um, and then I went into, I think it was 06, the summer of 05, sorry. Um, I went with Andre till I think it was late 09. Um, and then I kind of just focused myself on my own shop and some other stuff. And then in 14, I uh, kind of went back to Andre. Okay. So, okay. And yeah. I didn't know that you took that, uh, that break off and started your own shop. Obviously is it Sims, uh, racing? Is it what, that's what it's called? Yeah. It's Steve Sims racing. Steve so Sims it's racing. been yep. going since 2005 in some form. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of, when I left the team in 09, I kind of just ramped it up and did that more. Um, and now I do both still. Yeah, I'll get it get it rolling. But uh, is it Joel Saris, a throwback? I obviously raced against him uh, yeah. years ago, but uh, I, I do remember those days. And was that uh, the label it uh, Honda? I think they were Yamaha for a bit too. Was that the team that you were helping out with? Yeah. So when I was, I think label it helped Joel a little bit back then. And then with McCullough and Burke, uh, Brad was pretty heavily involved with them and through the team there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. good uh, good beginning, yeah. man. That's been. Uh, <laughs> You've been at this for quite a while now, about 18 seasons. Yeah, two, yeah, two. I mean, 2000, 2002, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. um, I did the East Coast with Joel. Yeah. So um, I've been hitting some form of nationals for quite yeah, a while. Yeah, no now. kidding. And now, when you came back to the yeah. team, uh, to the team, you took that time off. Were you uh, right into the manager role, or are you uh, mechanic still? Uh, no, I came back as a mechanic. Stu was managing the team still with Andre, and uh, uh, that was 14. Uh, so we, I was with Matt as a tech for 14, 15, 16, and then went into manager role uh, the winter of 17 when we did some U.S. Uh, we did the U.S. Arena Cross and then into the outdoors. Yeah, I remember seeing you guys do that. Um, I believe yeah. that uh, – was that the year the Arena Cross was – Atlanta Supercross slash Arena Cross that weekend they had uh, yes. all the, yeah that was a pretty cool setup yeah. there, but uh, yeah. now that uh, transition uh, from mechanic I mean there's a lot of mechanics out there trying to get to that you know premier role of being a manager was it a, a tough thing was there a lot more task involved or was it a little bit more laid back compared to being a mechanic and rushing around rebuilding bikes? No, I think for me it's probably a little more stressful. Um, I mean I grew up and my whole life I've been mechanical something in some way other mechanic diesel uh, small engines whatever so that was kind of a natural for me but uh, the paper side and sponsorships and all the daily emails was a little bit of different so i mean that definitely gets stressful as you guys know the emails never <laughs> stop um, so that was a little bit for me to get used to but i'm still i'm still heavily involved in the mechanic side of it i still do most of our engine builds um, in-house um, so we source motor parts out and then we build everything in-house um, Reese started to help me with that um, to help me relieve a little bit of that to let me do the other side of things but um, I'm still heavily involved that way and then when we go testing we're all there together still yeah I know you guys got a solid crew there and uh, you know definitely uh, it's nice for you to get out there and scratch that itch of doing motor stuff and I know you're still you got a lot of riders through the amateur that's running your your equipment 
Um, so you're still able to do the mechanic role while the manager, and yeah, the emails do not stop coming. One thing yeah. that I wanted to ask you was, what, and I know that you work right with Andre, you're kind of his right-hand man for this team. Now, when it comes down to picking riders for the team, I know that you had a big say in Sam Gaynor as kind of a project rider last year. He showed that he was able to step up into that role when Sean got hurt and, and be one of the top guys. Do you have a lot of say with these riders being picked, like the Phil, the Sean, the Sam uh, going forward? Uh, I didn't have a whole ton of say um, with Phil. Andre had done that a lot. Um, he met up with Lucas um, when we did the <clears throat> Winter X Games with Hilaire and we built a bike for Villapoto. Lucas is also Villapoto's agent. Um, so they got talking about Phil and coming up to Canada and that's where that one kind of came out. Um, the Sean side, I had quite a bit to do with it. And then obviously the Sam Gaynor thing. Uh, Moto Park helped him a lot. He was a Yamaha rider. I was doing a lot of his motor stuff and helping him where I could. Um, so it was kind of a good fit. He jumped into the 450 class because it was, he just recognized there was probably an easier chance to get support with a 450 than there was a little bike where everybody wanted to go. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of played into hands for him, and he's taken that role well. And um, you would hardly know he's only got really one 450 season underneath him. Yeah, that's a that's a big step to the 450. Um, we know that the the depth in the 250s a lot of privateers that can run that uh, you know 10, 15 pace and then in, creep into that top 10. Where Sam seemed to find himself the 8 to 10 in the 450 class and just nipping at the heels of the you know the five, six, seven. Um, where do you see Sam running this year? Is it gonna you see an improvement in his riding so far? I've only seen clips on Instagram and stuff like that, so I can't really tell. Yeah, like when we went testing South Carolina in February, um, he was riding well. He was getting going. He hadn't been there that long when we got there. Um, most people know Sean had a couple crashes there when we were down there, so that kind of opened the door up to test with Sam more so, as Phil obviously can't ride every day. Um, so the days that Phil wasn't riding, we kind of shifted our focus to Sam, and it let us gain some information from Sam uh, we tried some different suspension settings that the other guys had already run through. Um, and it definitely helped them. And uh, since we left, I know he had picked up quite a bit of speed and um, just endurance wise uh, to run that length of moto. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can all do this year. Yeah. Um, you know, they've all worked hard this winter. So uh, yep. it'll be nice to see where they all sit when, they, uh, when the gate finally drops here. Yeah, no, I've seen a lot of stuff, and it's awesome to have the social media, seeing these guys. Obviously, Sean uh, had a couple crashes there, and we talked to him a few weeks ago, and he sounds a lot better. He's back to riding out uh, in Kamloops. But um, one thing I wanted to say, it's, it's a contract year for pretty much all three of those guys. I know Sam's kind of on like a uh, whatever ride, like a sub ride, a B ride per se, but the other two guys, they're contract year, correct? Yeah, you could say that. They're all kind of up for contract in a way, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I know Sean's been there before where he rode with you guys and then he went to other teams and then back to you guys. So hopefully, I like all three of those guys and I'm hoping they can have a great year and they definitely, uh, you know, fill up three spots in that top 10 and it's always great battling with those guys. And uh, man, we really appreciate you coming on here, Steve, and can't wait to catch up to you at an actual race when we get to go. Hopefully it's go for Dunes uh, July 11th, but uh, man, we appreciate it and, uh, you know, have a good one and stay safe. Will do. Thanks for having me on here, and uh, hopefully we can all go racing here soon on July 11th. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Awesome. Thank you. You've got the ride, and we've got the parts to keep you going. Royal Superstores, with massive selections of products, no matter what your power sport is. Top brands you've come to trust. Huge selection. Amazing prices. Your one-stop shopping destination for the rider in you. Royal Distributing, Canada's power sports leader. Shop online, by phone, or in one of four retail locations. Fast coast-to-coast -coast shipping right to your door. Royal Distributing. Eat. Sleep. Ride. Aldi, and we're back with another social media check-in this week. I thought this was very cool. This is Ty Graham out in Manitoba. I don't know, actually not sure where he is, but he's putting together his Cowie. Unreal job by them. Very cool little time lapse. Yeah, those are cool. I, I always forget the time lapse. I have that on your phone or a GoPro or whatever you want to use. When you do these things and you watch them, it's kind of neat. And obviously, he's got time on his hands right now with not much racing going on and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Good job to tape that thing, and look at that beautiful cow getting built. Right there, though, this is the side. Thumbs up, Kyle. That is awesome. 
Yeah, thumbs up and Wild Rose is open for practice. Obviously they have uh, stipulations there and another track open in Ontario, Gopher Dunes. They opened up this Saturday and I'm sure everybody, that, there's so many, uh, so many people follow the Gopher Dunes and it's, they're probably pumped. And there's our guy, Phil Nicoletti. Yeah, down in Club MX. I like the summer grind and heat stroke is right around the corner. Then the comment, <laughs> heat strokes hits different in the 40s. <laughs> Making fun of <laughs> Phil's age. That's awesome. Uh, great cause right here happening on May 24th. This is going to be very cool. Yeah, it's uh, Colton Fasciati built track and Tanner Ward's putting on that uh, race, the virtual race. And then Sean Moffenbeier rocking that new FXR gear. Very cool to see that. That, that colorway gonna... looks awesome. Yeah. I, really I love like that, that color. Yeah. Huh? And there's uh, some Fox gear on the number nine. nine I love seeing yeah. that number nine on there with the uh, Dylan Wright on the Honda. Yeah, he's going to be exciting this, to watch for sure. Not Tyler Medagli in this photo. This is uh, Marshall <laughs> Walton. He won the Justin Brayton uh, Invitational shootout there uh, down in Idaho. Yeah, that, uh, that, look, that just went this weekend. Look at Quinn Amia, man. I feel like we're getting this kid in every week. He's just pounding the social feed out there. And, man, he's ripping in this little secret sand track. I love those tracks of the woods like that. Those are always fun. And, uh, I, yeah, that race on the weekend in Iowa there, the Justin Brayton Invitational, over 500 entries. So a good sign of things to come. They also announced this week that the regional um, Loretta's uh, qualifiers are opening back up in June. And this is just nothing but good signs for us moving ahead here, Kyle. Yeah, we're looking to, uh, to give you guys more updates on the, our schedule as well. Obviously, July 11th, 12th is set to uh, drop at Gopher Dunes. We're going to talk more about that in coming uh, episodes. But uh, right now, we're just happy to have our tracks back open, riders getting out there, uh, ripping around, and uh, all under stirp certain stipulations there, Galdi. Yeah. I know you, you as MRC put out a good guideline this past week. Yeah, for sure. Obviously, it's, it's some of them are a little in-depth and a little bit just like, oh, my God, are we really going to do this? You know, it's... But yeah, it's a document that we should all try to follow as best as possible uh, as we kind of get ourselves back in uh, tracks opening and then hopefully going back racing here sooner. And you know, it's some of the pressures that we put on in Ontario, the document they released as of tomorrow, it actually says motorcycle racing in the government document. So Ontario has said it. I can only imagine the rest of the provinces are going to uh, jump on board and do the same thing. And I, as MRC and Ryan Gold, and just being the the avid pusher that I am, I'm going to try to help with the rest of the provinces like I've been doing to get that wording put in these reopening processes as well. So the guidelines are set. We follow them. Looks like we're going to be back in business, Cal. Yeah, it's lucky number seven episode here. So we're finally back to riding after all those episodes of just talking about it. So here we go. Thanks again for joining me, Galdi. Always fun uh, chatting about Moto. And uh, we'll join back again next Wednesday for episode eight.